You need large amounts of self-discipline to deal courageously with all the fear-inducing events of your life. This is probably why Churchill said, Courage is rightly considered the foremost of the virtues, for upon it all, others depend. The fact is that everyone is afraid, usually of many things. This is normal and natural. Often, fear is necessary to preserve life, prevent injury, and guard against financial mistakes. So, if everyone is afraid, what is the difference between the brave person and the coward? The only difference is that the brave person disciplines himself to confront, deal with, and act in spite of fear. In contrast, the coward allows himself to be dominated and controlled by fear. Someone once said that with regard to warfare, although it applies to any situation, the difference between the hero and the coward is that the hero sticks in there five minutes longer. Fortunately, all fears are learned. No one is born with fears. Fears can therefore be unlearned by practicing self-discipline repeatedly with regard to fear until it goes away. The most common fears that sabotage all hopes for success are the fears of failure, poverty, and loss of money. These fears cause people to avoid risk of any kind and to reject opportunities when they're presented. Many other fears interfere with our happiness. The fear of loss of love, jobs, financial security, embarrassment, ridicule, rejection, criticism, and the loss of respect or esteem of others. Fear paralyzes action. The most common reaction in a fear situation is the attitude of, I can't. This is the fear of failure and loss that stops us from taking action. When a person is really afraid, their mouth and throat go dry, their heart starts pounding. Sometimes they breathe shallowly, their stomach turns, and often they feel like getting up and running to the bathroom. These are all physical manifestations of the inhibitive negative habit pattern we all experience from time to time. Whatever a person is in the grip of fear, they feel like a deer caught in the headlights of a car. This fear paralyzes action, often shutting down the brain and causing the individual to revert to the fight or flight reaction. Fear is a terrible emotion that undermines our happiness and can hold us back throughout our lives. On the opposite side, Aristotle described courage as the golden mean between the extremes of cowardice and impetuosity. He taught that to develop a quality that you lack, act as if you already had that quality in every situation where it is called for. In modern terms, however, we say, fake it until you make it. You can actually change your behavior by affirming, visualizing, and acting as if you already have the quality you desire. By affirming, repeat the words, I can do it emphatically whenever you feel afraid for any reason. You can cancel the feeling of, I can't. Every time you repeat the words, I can do it with conviction, you override your fear and increase your confidence. By repeating this affirmation over and over again, you can eventually build your courage and confidence to the point where you are unafraid. Visualize yourself performing with confidence and poise in an area where you are fearful. Your visual image will eventually be accepted by your subconscious mind as instructions for your performance. Your self-image, the way you see yourself and think about yourself, is eventually altered by feeding your mind these positive mental pictures of yourself performing at your best. By using the act-as-if method, you walk, talk, and carry yourself exactly as you would if you were completely unafraid in a particular situation. You stand up straight, smile, move quickly and confidently, and in every respect act as if you already had the courage that you desire. The law of reversibility says that if you feel a certain way, you will act in a manner consistent with that feeling. But if you act in a manner consistent with that feeling, even if you don't feel it, the law of reversibility will create the feeling that is consistent with your action. This is one of the greatest breakthroughs in success psychology. You develop the courage you desire by disciplining yourself repeatedly to do the thing you fear until that fear eventually disappears. And it will. When I work with sales organizations, they often ask me how to help a salesperson break out of a sales slump, especially in a tough economy. I give them a simple formula that is guaranteed to work every single time. It is called the 100 call method. In practicing this method, I instruct the salesperson to go out and call on 100 prospects as fast as he can, without caring at all whether or not he makes a sale. When the salesperson doesn't care if he makes a sale, his fear of rejection largely disappears. He stops caring if the prospect he is speaking to is interested or not interested. He has a single focus. To make a hundred calls as fast as he possibly can. One sales organization I work with has a daily prize for the first salesperson who gets rejected 10 times each morning at 8.30 a.m. 
All the salespeople sit down at their desks and start making calls to try to win the prize. By the time the contest is over, usually by 10 a.m., everyone's fears of rejection have been blown out of their systems. They're ready to call on prospects all day long, not caring at all about the reactions they get. Learn to speak on your feet. In 1923, Toastmasters International was formed with the expressed purpose of taking people who were terrified of public speaking and helping them become confident and competent when speaking on their feet in front of an audience. According to the Book of Lists, 54% of adults rate the fear of public speaking ahead of the fear of death. Toastmasters International had a solution. They created a system based on what psychologists call systematic desensitization. Once a week at a luncheon or dinner meeting, small groups of Toastmasters come together. Each person is required to stand up and give a short talk on a specific subject in front of a group of their peers. At the end of each talk, the speaker receives applause, positive input, and comments from the other members. At the end of the evening, each person is given a grade on their talk, even if it was only for 30 or 60 seconds. After six months of attending Toastmasters meetings, the individual will have stood on their feet and spoken 26 times, receiving positive applause and feedback each time. Because of this continuous positive reinforcement, their confidence increases dramatically. As a result of this process, countless Toastmasters have gone on to become excellent public speakers and prominent individuals in their businesses, organizations, and communities. Their fears of public speaking are gone forever. Psychologists have found that certain fears are bundled together in the subconscious mind, like wires on the same circuit. If you can overcome your fears in one of these areas, you will also eliminate other fears on the same circuit. The fear of rejection or call reluctance seems to be bundled together with the fear of public speaking. When you discipline yourself to join Toastmasters or to take a Dale Carnegie course to learn to speak confidently on your feet, your fears of rejection largely disappear as well. Your level of self-confidence in all your interactions with others increases dramatically. Your whole life changes in a positive way. Your ability to confront, deal with, and act in spite of your fears is the key to happiness and success. One of the best exercises you can practice is to identify a person or situation in your life of which you are afraid and resolve to deal with that fear situation immediately. Do not allow it to make you unhappy for another minute. Resolve to confront the situation or person and put the fear behind you. A woman in one of my seminars told me that her boss was a very negative person. He was constantly criticizing and berating her about her work even though she was one of the highest rated employees in the organization. He was making her life miserable. She didn't want to give up her job, but she was afraid of confronting him. She asked me what she should do. I gave her this advice, which I subsequently gave to many other people. The only reason that one person bullies another is that they feel they can get away with it. The only way to deal with a bully is to confront him. Bullies are actually cowards at heart, and they will flee from a confrontation. The next time your boss criticizes you for any reason, turn to him and say quite firmly, I would appreciate it if you not talk to me like that ever again. It hurts my feelings and stops me from doing my job the way you want. I told her to look him straight in the eye, after she had finished making this statement. Well, she had tremendous courage. Rather than putting up with this situation any longer, the next time her boss began to berate her, she squared off with him and said those words. She wrote to me and told me what had happened. Just as I had predicted, he stopped dead in his tracks. He immediately apologized and mumbled, then quickly went back to his office. He never criticized her again. She told me that she could have ended his bad treatment of her many months before, if she had only had the courage to confront him directly the first time it happened. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. When you identify a fear and discipline yourself to move toward it, it grows smaller and more manageable. What's more, as your fears grow smaller, your confidence grows larger. Soon, your fears lose their control over you. In contrast, when you back away from a fear-inducing situation or person, your fear grows larger and larger. Soon, it dominates your thinking and feeling, preoccupies you during the day, and often keeps you awake at night. In leadership, the most common quality is that of vision. Leaders have a clear vision of where they want to take their organizations. Leaders also have a clear vision of where they want to be sometime in the future in their personal lives. The second most common quality of leaders is that of courage. Leaders have the courage to do whatever is necessary to fulfill their vision. They lead from the front and dare to go forward.
There are two types of courage that you need. First, you need the courage to launch, to take action, to take a leap of faith. You need the courage to go all in without any guarantee of success, and with a high possibility of failure, at least in the short term. The major feeling that holds most people back is that, in spite of all their best intentions, they don't have the courage to take the first step. The second type of courage that you need is called courageous patience. This is the ability to hang in there and continue working and fighting after you've gone all in and before you have yet seen any results or rewards. Many people can muster up the courage to take action toward a new goal, but when they see no immediate result, they immediately lose heart and pull back to safety and security. The only way to deal with a fear is to address it head on. Remind yourself that denial is not a river in Egypt. The natural tendency of many people is to deny that they have a problem caused by a fear of some kind. They're afraid of confronting it. In turn, it becomes a major source of stress, unhappiness, and psychosomatic illness. Deal with the situation or person directly. As Shakespeare said, take arms against the sea of troubles, and in so doing, end them. Whenever you're worried about something, fill out a disaster report on the situation. This will destroy your fear and worry almost instantly. This is often called the worry buster. The disaster report has four parts. Define the worry situation clearly. What exactly are you worried about? Very often, when you take the time to be completely clear about the worry situation, a way to resolve that situation becomes immediately evident. Identify the worst possible thing that could happen if this worry situation were to take place. Would you lose your job? Would you lose your relationship? Would you lose your money? What's the worst thing that could possibly happen? Be clear about this. In many cases, you will see that should the worst occur, it would not ruin you. It might be inconvenient or uncomfortable, but you would eventually recover. You will find that it's probably not worth all the worry that you are devoting to it. The third step in the disaster report is to resolve to accept the worst possible outcome should it occur. Say to yourself, well, yeah, if that happens, it won't kill me. I'll find a way to get along. Most of the stress of worry comes from denial, from not being willing to face the worst possible thing that could happen. But once you resolve to accept the worst, should it occur, all the worry and stress seem to disappear. Begin immediately to improve on the worst. Take every step that you possibly can to make sure that the worst possible outcome does not occur. Take action immediately. Do something. Get on with it. Act quickly. Get so busy making sure that the worst thing does not happen that you have no time to worry. In the final analysis, the only real cure for fear or worry is discipline. Purposeful action in the direction of your goals. Get so busy working on your goals or the solutions to your problems that you have no time to be afraid or to worry about anything. When you practice the self-discipline of courage and force yourself to face any fear-inducing situation in your life, your self-esteem goes up, your self-respect increases, and your sense of personal power grows. You eventually reach the point in life where you're not afraid of anything. You are your most valuable asset. Your life, your potential, and your possibilities are the most precious things you have. Thus, your great goal in life should be to fulfill that potential and become everything you are capable of becoming. Your ability to learn, grow, and fulfill your potential is unlimited. Today, people are graduating from high school and college in their 70s, learning new subjects, and developing new capabilities. Your ability to learn and remember can continue throughout your life if you keep your brain alive, alert, and functioning at its best. Your most precious financial asset is your earning ability. Your ability to work is your primary source of cash throughout your life. You could lose your home, your car, your bank account, or everything you own. But as long as you have your earning ability, you can earn it all back and more in the months and years ahead. Your biggest investment is yourself. Most people don't realize this. They take their earning ability for granted. But it has taken you your entire life to develop your earning ability. Every bit of education, experience, and hard work that you have invested in learning your craft and developing your skills has gone into building this asset. Your earning ability is very much like a muscle. It can increase and strengthen over time with regular exercise. Likewise, if left alone or ignored, your earning ability, like your muscles, can become weaker or decline because you have simply failed to upgrade it continually. In other words, your earning ability can be either an appreciating or depreciating asset. An appreciating asset is something that grows in value and cash flow every year, 
as a result of continual investment and improvement. A depreciating asset, on the other hand, is something that loses value over time and finally reaches the point at which it is written off with little or no further value. The choice is yours as to whether your earning ability is increasing or decreasing month by month and year by year. See yourself as the president of your own personal services corporation. Imagine that you're going to take your company public on the stock market. Would you recommend your company as a growth stock, continually increasing its value and earning ability each year? Or would you describe your company as one that has leveled off in the marketplace, not really going anywhere in terms of increased value and income? Would you recommend stock in U Inc. as an excellent investment? Why or why not? What got you here won't get you any further. Some people are actually losing value each year, declining in earning ability because they are not continually upgrading their knowledge and skills. They don't realize that whatever knowledge and skill they have today are rapidly becoming obsolete. It's being replaced by new knowledge and skills that if you don't have them and someone else does, you'll be in danger of being overtaken by your competition. Join the top 20%. In Chapter 1, I mentioned that the 80-20 rule applies to income. The top 20% of people in our society earn and control 80% of the assets. According to Forbes, Fortune, Business Week, The Wall Street Journal, and the IRS, by many estimates, the top 1% of Americans control as much as 33% of the assets. The most interesting discovery in income inequality is that most millionaires, multimillionaires, and billionaires in America are first generation. They started with little or nothing and earned all their money by themselves in one lifetime. In America, there's a high level of income mobility, which means that you are able to move from the lower levels of income to the upper levels. Almost everyone who is in the top 20% today started in the bottom 20%. From that point, they began to do something different with their time and their lives, and as a result, they put themselves squarely onto the upward escalator of financial success. No limits on your potential. The average income increase in America is about 3% a year, just about the same as the rate of inflation and cost of living increases. People whose income is increasing at 3% a year seldom get ahead. They have a job, which can also be thought of as an acronym for just over broke. But the fact is that no one is better than you, and no one is smarter than you. If someone is doing better than you are today, it is simply proof that they have learned how the law of cause and effect applies to their work and they have begun doing the things that other successful people have also done. The application of the law of cause and effect to your personal life is learn and do. The achievement of personal excellence is a decision you make or that you fail to make. But in the absence of a commitment to excellence in your chosen field, you automatically default to average performance or even mediocrity. No one becomes excellent accidentally or by just going to work each day. Excellence requires a definite decision and a lifelong commitment. The Keys to the 21st Century Knowledge and skill are the keys to the 21st century. Becoming the best person you can possibly be and moving to the top of your field requires the application of self-discipline throughout your life. Mental fitness is like physical fitness. If you want to achieve either, you must work at it all the time. You can never let up. You must be continually learning and growing every day, week, and month throughout your career and in other areas of your life if you're going to join the top 20% and stay there. To earn more, you must learn more. Abraham Lincoln once wrote, The fact that some have become wealthy is proof that others may do it as well. What others have done, you can do as well if you learn how. Everyone who is at the top was once at the bottom. Many people who come from average or poor families with average incomes, or who grow up in adverse circumstances, have gone on to become some of the most prominent people in their fields. And what hundreds of thousands and even millions of other people have done, you can do as well. The philosopher Bertrand Russell once wrote, The very best proof that something can be done is that someone else has already done it. Ordinary into extraordinary. Very often you see people who don't seem to be as intelligent or as talented as you are, who are nonetheless accomplishing remarkable things with their lives. There's nothing that will make you angrier than to see someone who seems to be dumber than you, who is doing better than you. How can this be? The answer is simple. At a certain point in their lives, they realized that the key to success was personal and professional growth. It was a dedication to lifelong learning that made them successful. The good news is that almost every important skill is learnable. Every business skill is learnable. 
Everyone who is proficient in any area of business was, at one time, completely ignorant in that area. Every sales skill is learnable. Every top salesperson was once a beginning salesperson and unable to make a call or close a sale. While money-making skills are learnable as well, almost every wealthy person who was once poor has learned this. You can learn anything you need to learn to achieve any goal you can set for yourself. Make a decision. The starting point of your moving upward and onward toward becoming one of the most competent, most respected and highest paid people in your field is simple. Make a decision. It's said that every major change in your life comes about when your mind collides with a new idea, and then you make a decision to do something different. You make a decision to complete your education, upgrade your skills, or get into a good college. You make a decision to start a new business. You make a decision to take a particular job or start a particular career. You make a decision to invest your money in a particular way. And especially, you make a decision to be the best in your field. Many people say that they would like to be happy, healthy, thin, and rich. But as discussed in Chapter 4, wishing and hoping are not enough. You have to make a firm, unequivocal decision that you are going to pay any price and go any distance in order to achieve the goals you have set for yourself. You have to make that decision and then burn your mental bridges behind you. From that moment on, you resolve to continue working on yourself and your craft until you reach the top 20% or beyond. Follow the leaders, not the followers. When you decide to be one of the best people in your field, look around you and identify the people who are already at the top. What characteristics do they have in common? How do they plan and organize their days? How do they dress? How do they walk, talk, and behave with other people? What books do they read? How do they spend their spare time? Who do they associate with? What courses have they taken? What audio programs do they listen to in their cars? These are just a few of the questions you should ask in order to find out what successful people are doing that you might also need to do. After all, you can't hit a target that you can't see. Your selection of the right role models can have an enormous impact on your future. Dr. David McClelland of Harvard and author of The Achieving Society concluded that your choice of a reference group can determine as much as 95% of your success at achievement in life. Your reference group is made up of the people who you feel are just like me. Your natural tendency is to adopt the attitudes, styles of dress, opinions, and lifestyles of the people with whom you identify and associate most of the time. Fly with the Eagles Some years ago, one of my seminar participants told me his story. Bob Barton said he had started off in his 20s in a large company with about 32 salespeople in his branch. It was his first real job, and he was starting at the bottom. Because he was new, he hung around with the other junior salespeople. As they say, birds of a feather flock together. After a month or two, Bob noticed that the top salespeople in the office also associated with each other. They did not spend time with the junior salespeople. They also spent their time differently. When Bob got into work in the morning, the top salespeople were already there, planning their days and working on the telephone and making appointments. Bob also noticed that the junior salespeople would come in later, drink coffee, read the newspaper, and make excuses for not making sales calls. Bob decided that he was going to pattern himself after the top salespeople in the office. He looked at the way they dressed and groomed, and he resolved to dress and groom the way they did. Each morning, he would stand in front of his mirror and ask himself, Do I look like one of the top salespeople in my office? If the answer was no, he would go back and change his clothes until he felt that he looked as good as the best people. He began to come into the office and organize his day before 8.30 a.m., so that he was ready to make calls as soon as his customers were available to see him. One day, Bob asked one of the top salespeople if he could recommend a book or audio program that would help him. It turns out that top people are always willing to help other people improve. When he got the recommendation, Bob immediately went out and got the book and sent away for the audio program. He read the book and listened to the program, and then reported back to the top salesman. The top salesman gave him some more advice on things to read and listen to all of which Bob followed. Bob asked another salesperson how he planned his day, and that salesperson showed him his time management system. So Bob began to plan and organize his day the way the top salespeople did it. By using these top salespeople as his role models and emulating them whenever possible, Bob started to make more appointments, see more prospects, and make more sales. Within six months, he was one of the top salespeople in the office as well. By that time, 
The top salespeople had invited him for coffee and lunch, and he became one of them rather than one of the junior people. The next year, Bob went to the National Sales Conference, where he met a lot of the top people from around the country. He deliberately sought them out and asked for their advice. What books would they suggest? What audio programs would they recommend? What seminars had they attended? What strategies did they find that were the most effective in building their sales business? Bob did something that very few people do. When he received advice, he followed it. He immediately took action on the advice and then reported back to the people who had given it to him. Within four years, Bob became one of the top salespeople in the country. His friends and associates were the other top salespeople in his branch and in the other branches. His income had increased several times. He wore beautiful clothes, drove a new car, lived in a lovely home, and had a wonderful wife. And he said that it all came about as a result of asking top salespeople for their input, and then following that input, and applying it to his sales activities. But here's the kicker. Over and over, the top people, the ones who had been winning the sales awards year after year, told Bob the same thing. He was the first person who had ever come up to them and asked them for advice. No one else had ever sought them out and asked them why they were so successful. All the answers have been found. Here is a great discovery. All the answers have been found. All the routes to success have been discovered. Everything you need to learn to move to the top of your field has already been learned by hundreds and even thousands of other people. And if you ask them for advice, they will give it to you. Successful people will have their phone calls held, cancel other appointments, and put their work aside to help other people to be successful. But you must ask, and then you must follow their advice once they give it to you. If you can't ask them directly, read their books, attend their talks and seminars, and listen to audio programs created by successful people. Sometimes, you can send them emails and ask for advice. Learn from the best. Set high income as a goal. If your goal is to be in the top 20% of money makers in your field, the first thing you need to do is find out what the people in the top 20% are earning today. This information is available. Just ask around, check industry statistics, or search on Google. Once you know the income target you are aiming for, write it down as your goal. Make a plan to achieve this level of income and work on it every day. Never stop until you reach it. The secret to high income in business and sales is quite simple. Learn and do. Like jacking up a car, you improve one notch at a time. Each time you learn and practice a new skill, you ratchet up your earning ability, and it locks in. As long as you keep increasing your earning ability, you keep ratcheting up to a higher level from which you seldom decline. Use the 3% formula to invest in yourself. To guarantee your lifelong success, make a decision today to invest 3% of your income back into yourself. According to the American Society for Training and Development, this is the percentage that the most profitable 20% of companies in every industry invest in the training and development of their staff. Decide today to invest 3% of your income into yourself to make yourself an appreciating asset and continually increase your earning ability. If your annual income goal is $50,000, resolve to invest 3% of that amount, or $1,500, back into yourself each year to maintain and upgrade your knowledge and skills. If your income goal is $100,000, resolve to invest $3,000 per year back into yourself to assure that you reach that level of income. The payoff is extraordinary. I was giving a seminar in Detroit a couple of years ago, when a young man, about 30 years old, came up to me at the break. He told me that he had first come to my seminar, and heard my 3% rule about 10 years ago. At that time, he had dropped out of college, was living at home, driving an old car, and earning about $20,000 a year as an office-to-office -office salesman. He decided after the seminar that he was going to apply the 3% rule to himself, and he did so immediately. He calculated 3% of his income of $20,000 would be $600. He began to buy sales books and read them every day. He invested in two audio learning programs on sales and time management. He took one sales seminar, he invested the entire $600 in himself in learning to become better. That year, his income went from $20,000 to $30,000, an increase of 50%. He said he could trace the increase with great accuracy to the things he had learned and applied from the books he had read and the audio programs he had listened to. So the following year, he invested 3% of $30,000, a total of $900, back into himself. That year, his income jumped from $30,000 to $50,000.
He began to think, if my income goes up at 50% per year by investing 3% back into myself, what would happen if I invested 5%? The next year, he invested 5% of his income, $2,500, into his learning program. He took more seminars, traveled cross-country to a conference, bought more audio and video learning programs, and even hired a part-time coach. That year, his income doubled to $100,000. After that, he decided to go all in and raised his investment into himself to 10% per year. He told me that he'd been doing this ever since. I asked him, how has investing 10% of your income back into yourself affected your income? He smiled and said, I passed a million dollars in personal income last year, and I still invest 10% of my income in myself every single year. I said, wow, that's a lot of money. How do you manage to spend that much money on personal development? He said, it's hard. I have to start spending money on myself in January in order to invest it all by the end of the year. I have an image coach, a sales coach, and a speaking coach. I have a large library in my home with every book, audio program, and video program on sales and personal success I can find. I attend conferences both nationally and internationally in my field, and my income keeps going up every year. There are three simple steps to become the best. Becoming one of the top people in your field requires discipline and application more than anything else. There are three simple steps that you can follow to become the very best in your field. Read 60 minutes in your field each day. Turn off the television and the radio. Put aside the newspaper and read material about your field for one hour each day before you start working. Listen to educational audio programs in your car. Start them and stop them as you listen so that you can reflect on what you have just heard and think about how you can apply the ideas to your work. Attend courses and seminars in your field regularly. Seek them out. Take online courses in the convenience of your own home. Courses that enable you to upgrade your skills and give you important ideas that you can use to be even more successful. The power of compound learning, like compound interest, is quite amazing. The more you learn, the more you can learn. The more you learn, the better your brain functions, and the smarter you get. Your memory and retention rate improve. The more you learn, the more relationships you find between something you learned at one time, and something you learn at another time. Never stop learning and growing. The Achievement of Mastery how long does it take to achieve mastery in your field? According to the experts, the acquisition of mastery requires about 7 years or 10,000 hours of hard work. It takes 7 years to become a master salesperson, a successful business person, an excellent diesel mechanic, or an excellent brain surgeon. It seems to take 7 years or 10,000 hours of hard work to get to the top of any field. So you might as well get started. The time is going to pass anyway. The starting point of achieving mastery is for you to commit to excellence. I've never met a person who made a decision to get into the top 20% in their field who did not eventually achieve it. And I never met a person who got there having not made that decision. Making the decision and then following up with continuous purposeful disciplined action is essential. Talent is not enough. As I mentioned earlier, according to Jeffrey Colvin in his best-selling book, Talent is Overrated. Most people learn how to do their job in the first year, and then they never get any better. They just coast in their jobs. But the only direction you can coast is downhill. Many people will work away at a job for many years and never rise above the average. They will do their job from 8 to 5, but they never lift a finger to upgrade their skills. They will not invest any time learning their craft unless their company pays for the extra training and gives them the time off to take it. The average person does only an average job, and as a result, earns an average income and worries about money all his life. He never realizes that often there is only a thin veil that separates the average person from the excellent person. The fact is that if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. No one stays in the same place for long. Two hours each day will get you to the top. It's been calculated that all you need to invest is about two extra hours per day to move from average to superior. Only two extra hours each day will move you from worrying about money all your life to being one of the highest paid people in your field. People immediately ask, where am I going to get an extra two hours each day? It's simple. Take a piece of paper and do the following simple calculation. Calculate the number of hours in a week. Seven days times 24 hours equals 168 hours. 
If you deduct 40 hours for work and 56 hours for sleep, you have 72 hours left over. If you deduct 3 hours per day, 21 hours, for getting ready for and traveling to and from work, that leaves you 51 hours of spare time to do with as you please. If you invest 2 hours per day back into yourself, 14 hours per week, you still have 37 hours left over. That's an average of more than 5 hours per day of free time. All you need to do is devote 2 hours each day to move you from average performance to superior performance at whatever you choose to do. Form the habit of continuous learning. The best news is that when you begin reading personal or professional development literature, listening to audio programs in your car, taking additional courses, and upgrading your skills in the evenings and on the weekends rather than watching television, you soon get into the habit of continuous learning. In no time at all, it will become automatic and easy for you to learn, grow, and upgrade your skills every day and every week. The average adult watches about 5 hours of television each day. For some people it is 7 or 8 hours. They turn on the television first thing in the morning and watch it until they leave for work. They turn it back on as soon as they get home from work. They then watch television until 11 or 12 o'clock at night, going to bed without enough time to get a good night's sleep. They then get up in the morning, drink coffee, and watch television for as long as they can before they go off to work once more. You can be rich or poor. It's your decision. Your television set can make you rich or poor. If you watch it all the time, it will make you poor. Psychologists have shown that the more television you watch, the lower are your levels of energy and self-esteem. At an unconscious level, you don't like or respect yourself as much if you sit there hour after hour watching television. People who watch too much television also gain weight and become physically unfit from sitting around too much. Your television can also make you rich, but only if you turn it off. When you turn off your television, you free up time you can then use to invest in becoming a better, smarter, or more competent person. When you leave your television off when you are with your family, you'll find yourself talking, sharing, communicating, and laughing more often. When you leave your television off for extended periods of time, you break the habit of watching television, and you'll hardly miss it at all. Your television can be an excellent servant, but it's a terrible master. The choice is yours. Increase your income 1000%. There is a simple 7-step formula you can use to increase your productivity, performance, output, and income by 1000% over the next 10 years. It works for everyone who tries it. It is simple. Step 1. Arise 2 hours before your first appointment, or before you have to be at work. Invest the first hour in yourself by reading something educational, motivational, or spiritual. As Henry Ward Beecher once said, the first hour is the rudder of the day. When you get up and invest the first hour in yourself, you set yourself up mentally to have an excellent day. You'll be more positive, alert, creative and productive all day long when you start your day by investing the first hour in yourself. If you read in your field one hour per day, that will translate into about one book per week. One book per week will translate into about 50 books per year. The average adult reads less than one non-fiction book per year. If you were to read 50 books in your field each year, do you think that would give you an edge in your profession? Do you think that it would move you ahead of virtually everyone else in your business? Of course it would. If you read 50 books per year for 10 years, this would be 500 books that would help you to improve your productivity, performance, and income. At the very least, you would need a bigger house just to hold your books, and you'd be able to afford it. Reading one hour per day in your field will make you a national authority in three to five years. This alone can give you your thousand percent increase over the course of your career. Step 2. Rewrite your goals every day. Get a spiral notebook and rewrite your major goals in the present tense every morning before you start out. Without looking back at what you wrote the previous day, this writing and rewriting is the process of programming instructions into the guidance mechanism of your mind. When you rewrite your 10 goals each morning, you will continually see and think of opportunities to achieve those goals all day long. You'll become more focused, channeled, and directed. You'll be more purposeful and determined, and you will achieve your goals much faster than if they were merely wishes floating around in the back of your mind. Writing and rewriting your goals each day can give you your 1000% increase in income over 10 years. Step 3. Plan every day in advance. Make a list and set priorities on your work before you start off. Your ability to set priorities and to choose the most important thing that you could be doing at every moment is the key to organizing your life and doubling your productivity. 
Working on your top priorities can increase your income by 1,000% over 10 years, and it is probably impossible to achieve without it. Step 4. Discipline yourself to concentrate single-mindedly on one thing. Choose the most important thing that you can do each day, then start on it first thing, and work on it until it's 100% complete. Your ability to focus and concentrate, when you develop and hone it into a habit all by itself, will enable you to double your productivity, performance, and output in the next month, and it will give you your 1,000% increase over 10 years. Step 5. Listen to educational audio programs in your car. The average business person who drives spends 500 to 1,000 hours per year behind the wheel of their car. When you turn your car into a university on wheels, a mobile classroom, you get the educational equivalent of one to two full-time university semesters as you drive around. Many people have gone from rags to riches by simply listening to educational audio programs in their cars as they drive from place to place. You could do the same. This alone could give you your 1,000% increase. Step 6. Ask two magic questions after every call or event. First, ask yourself, what did I do right? Then ask yourself, what would I do differently? The first question, what did I do right, forces you to think through and recall all the correct things that you did in that last meeting, presentation or event, even if it was not successful. Write them down. The second question, what would I do differently? forces you to think through all the different ways you can improve your performance in a similar situation. Write these ideas down as well. In both cases, by reviewing your performance, by thinking about what you did right and what you would do differently, you program yourself to perform even better the next time. This is one of the fastest and most powerful exercises in personal growth and development I have ever discovered. This process dramatically speeds up the rate at which you move into the top 20%. Step 7. Treat every person you meet like a million dollar customer. Treat each person you meet and work with, both at home and in the office, as though he or she is the most important person in the world. When you treat people as if they are valuable and important, they will return the favor by treating you as if you are valuable and important as well. They will want to be associated with you, work for you, buy from you, and introduce you to their friends. You begin treating people like million dollar customers by starting at home with the members of your family. Remember. They are the most important people in your life. So, when you start your day well, first thing in the morning by making the members of your family feel important and telling them that you love them, you'll be more positive, relaxed, and happier for the rest of the day. Fully 85% of your success will be determined by how much people like and respect you, especially in business and sales. Never miss an opportunity to treat people well. When you practice these seven steps each day for a month, you will see changes and improvements in your life, work, and income that will astonish you. After a month of regular practice, you'll have formed a new habit of continuous personal improvement that can carry you onward and upward for the rest of your life. The best lifelong personal development and the commitment to personal excellence require tremendous dedication, discipline, and willpower. The greatest payoff is that every time you learn and apply something new, your brain releases endorphins which make you feel happier and more excited about your future. Every time you learn and apply something new, you'll have a greater sense of personal power. Your self-esteem, self-respect, and personal pride will increase. You'll feel very much in control of your earning ability, which is one of the most important parts of your life. I discovered that success is not an accident. Failure is not an accident either. I also discovered that people who are successful in any area are usually those who have learned the cause and effect relationships between what they wanted and how to get it. They then did repeatedly what other successful people did in a particular area until they got the same results. This insight changed my life. No one is really better than you and no one is really smarter than you. They just may be better or smarter in different ways, at least for the present. If someone is doing better than you are today, it's probably because he or she has discovered the cause and effect relationships before you have and anything that anyone else has done within limits, you can do as well. The fact that someone else has achieved a worthy goal is the very best proof that you can achieve that goal as well. Personal and professional development is the most powerful tool that you can use to achieve any goal you can set for yourself. You can move yourself from wherever you are to wherever you want to go by simply learning how others have done it before you and then by following the paths that they have already blazed. 
You've heard it said that the average person uses only 10% of his or her potential. According to the Stanford Brain Institute, however, it is actually closer to 2%. The average person has enormous reserves of potential that he or she habitually fails to use. Nature is exceedingly generous. She provides each person with an abundance of abilities and possibilities, most of which go untapped throughout life. If you were to use only a small additional percentage of your inborn capabilities, you could probably double and triple your results. You could accomplish things far beyond anything that you have ever done up to now. You could be healthier, happier, and more prosperous than you've ever imagined. I believe that each person has the potential to do something wonderful with his or her life. I believe that within each person there is a giant waiting to come out. I believe that each person can do vastly more than he or she has ever done before, if he or she only learns how. That's my fundamental value. What is yours? Create a long-term vision for yourself in the area of personal growth. Project forward 5 or 10 years and imagine that you were developed fully in every important part of your life. Idealize and see yourself as outstanding in every respect. Refuse to compromise on your personal dreams. What level of skill or ability would you have in your field? What level of status and prestige would you have attained as a result of your superb performance at what you do? What kind of work would you be doing, and at what level would you be doing this work? How would you think and feel about yourself as a result of being one of the very best at what you do? If you had no limitations at all, what would be your vision for how you would develop yourself in the months and years ahead? Now take your vision and crystallize it into specific goals. Here's a good way to start. Take out a piece of paper and write down 10 goals that you would like to achieve in the area of personal and professional development in the months and years ahead. Write them in the present tense, exactly as if you were already the person you intend to be. Determine exactly what you want to be able to do. Decide the person you want to become. Describe exactly what you will look like when you become truly excellent in your field and your personal life. Then, review this list of 10 goals and select the one goal that, if you achieved it, would have the greatest positive impact on your life and on your career. Put a circle around that goal and move that goal to a clean sheet of paper. Create a schedule for achieving this goal. Set deadlines for achieving certain benchmarks. Set sub-deadlines as well. Make a list of everything that you can think of that you'll have to do to achieve personal excellence in that area. Organize your list into a plan by setting priorities on each of the items. Gather the books, materials, equipment, and other resources you will need to begin working on yourself and your goal. Then, take immediate action on at least one item in your plan to get the process started. Resolve to do something every day until you are successful in that area. Never stop working on yourself until you become the kind of person you would ideally most like to be. Set specific measures on each of your goals. If your goal is to excel in your field, determine how you'll be able to know when you've achieved it. Decide how you could measure your progress and evaluate your success. Perhaps you can use as a measure the number of hours that you study in your field each week. Perhaps you can measure the number of books you read or the number of audio programs that you listen to. Perhaps you can measure your progress by the number of appointments you get, or the number of sales you make as a result of your growing skills. Compare yourself against these measures on a regular basis. The more precise your measures and the more you pay attention to them, the better you will become in that area and the greater progress you will make. You first determine your values, your vision, your goals, and the knowledge and skill you require to achieve them. You decide upon the ways that you will measure your progress toward each of them. You then do something every day that makes you better in some way. You read, take courses, listen to audio programs, and practice your new skills. And never stop improving. Select the specific habits and behaviors that you will need to practice every day to become the person you want to become. These could be the habits of clarity, planning, thoroughness, studiousness, hard work, determination, and persistence. Perhaps the most important single quality for success is self-discipline. Albert Hubbard, the writer, defined self-discipline as the ability to make yourself do what you should do, when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not. Napoleon Hill calls self-discipline the master key to riches. Every day and every hour of every day, you have to practice self-discipline. There are seven disciplines that you must develop if you want to achieve all that is possible for you. You can learn each of these disciplines through practice and repetition until they become automatic. Here they are. The discipline of daily goal setting. The discipline of daily planning and organizing. 
The discipline of daily priority setting. The discipline of daily concentration on your highest value activities. The discipline of daily exercise and proper nutrition. The discipline of daily learning and growth. The discipline of taking time daily for the most important people in your life. These seven disciplines will virtually assure that you perform at the very highest level and get the greatest satisfaction and results from everything you do. There's a simple, practical, proven self-development formula that you can use to double your income in the years ahead. Most people who practice this formula each day report extraordinary improvements in their lives. Try it and see for yourself. I call it the thousand percent formula. This thousand percent formula is based on the law of incremental improvement. No matter how excited or determined you are, change and progress take place slowly. It takes you your entire life to become the person you are today. It takes a period of hard work and determination to become someone different. We do not usually make significant and lasting changes in quantum leaps. All permanent change is progressive over a long period of time. This type of change requires patience and discipline. It is only this type of change that is truly worthwhile and enduring. If you continually learn, study, and upgrade your skills, clarifying and re-clarifying your goals, set better and clearer priorities, and focus on progressively more valuable tasks, you could increase your overall productivity, performance, and output by one-tenth of one percent each day, day after day, indefinitely. Because of the law of increasing returns, every effort you make to be more productive in one area will tend to improve your performance in every other area at the same time. You will get better and better results in less time. The more you practice, if you become one-tenth of one percent more productive each day, five days per week, at the end of one week, you will be one-half of one percent more productive, as one-tenth of a percent times five equals 0 0.5 or half a percent. At the end of four weeks, you will be two percent more productive. That's four times half a percent equals two percent. At the end of 52 weeks, you'll be 26 percent more productive than you were at the beginning of the year which is 13 four-week months times 2% per month equals 26%. This is where the compounding effect of new knowledge and skill begins to work. An improvement of 26% per year, compounded over 10 years, will result in an increase of 1,004% in your overall productivity in one decade. Now since we live in a merit-based society, as you increase your ability to contribute value, the amount you will be paid will increase as well. By improving your overall performance by 1,004%, your income will eventually rise to match the value of your contribution. Well, here are the seven steps in the thousand percent formula that will guarantee that you become at least one-tenth of one percent better daily, one-half percent better each week, two percent better each month, and 26 percent better each year. Arise two hours before your first appointment and read for one hour in your field. This is called the golden hour, and it sets the tone for the rest of the day. Leave the television off, put the newspaper aside, invest the first 60 minutes in yourself and in your mind. This first hour is the rudder of the day. Rewrite and review your major goals each day. Before you start off, take a few minutes to write out your goals in a spiral notebook in the present tense, as though you had already achieved them. This programs them into your subconscious mind to be alert to opportunities to achieve your goals all day long. Plan every day in advance. Make a list of everything that you have to do the night before, before you end your workday, and before you go to bed. This enables your subconscious mind to work on your list while you sleep. Often when you awake in the morning, you'll have ideas and insights that will enable you to achieve your daily goals faster and more effectively. Always concentrate on the most valuable use of your time. Select the one task that can have the greatest positive impact on your work life and begin on that task first thing in the morning. Listen to educational audio programs in your car. Turn your car into a mobile classroom, the university on wheels. Never allow your car to be moving without educational audio programs playing. This activity is so powerful that it alone can give you your thousand percent increase over the years ahead. Ask two questions after every experience. These are really magic questions in that they enable you to learn and grow more rapidly from everything that happens to you. The two questions are, 1. What did I do right? 2. What would I do differently? According to the law of concentration, whatever you dwell upon grows in your experience. Whatever you pay attention to increases in your life. Whatever you focus on, you tend to do better. The seventh and final ingredient in the thousand percent formula is for you to treat everyone you meet like a million dollar customer. 
Treat the people you work with the same way you would treat a valuable customer of your firm. Treat each prospect or customer as if they had already purchased a million dollars worth of what your company sells and were thinking of doing it again. Especially treat the people at home as though they were the most valuable people in the world to you. Because they are. Remember, you are your most valuable resource. Your earning ability is your most valuable asset. Invest every day in improving yourself as a person and in increasing your ability to earn even more. Decide today to develop yourself to the point where you can achieve every financial and personal goal you can ever set and become everything you are capable of becoming. One and one half percent of the population starts work for the first time, taking their first job as adults. So it's like a big marathon, a big race where everyone lines up, and then the gun goes off with a bang, and everybody starts to run. Just like a marathon, some people get way ahead. In this case, in the earnings race, the great majority stay in the middle, and some people fall well behind. So, they just finished a 25-year study, which I think is one of the great studies on success that's ever been done. They asked, how is it that these people can be earning so much money in a paycheck? They're receiving almost a million dollars a month for going to work, and if they lost their job for any reason, another company would hire them immediately and pay them $10 million a year. How can this happen? So, these researchers at a major university went back and said, well, these people must be very intelligent. They must have special gifts. They must have certain qualities or talents that enable them to be so successful in life. So, they went back and looked at their school records, the records at their first job, and their second job. And you know what they found? These people were just average. Even when they started off their work life, they didn't look any different from anyone else. They were just average. But then, they all started to practice a single strategy, and this is the strategy that will change your life and your career forever. And it's so simple you can't believe it. When these people took their first job, the first thing they would do is they would go to their boss and they would say, Boss, I want to make a valuable contribution in this work, and I want to be successful in this company. What one skill would help me the most to be more successful, to make a more valuable contribution? And the boss would say, Well, if you were very good at negotiating, or team building, or selling, or reading financial statements, if you were really good at this, then you would be much more valuable than an average person. So, they would say, okay, and they would write down the development of that skill as a goal, just like a lesson plan for a subject in school. And they would go to work, and they would work on this one skill like a sniper, rather than a machine gunner. They would work on a single skill, and it might take them a month, or it might take some three months, and it might take them a year. But they would work every day on that skill. And here's the magic number. The magic number was two hours per day, five days per week, 10 hours in all. Two hours per day of personal study on a single skill. Five days per week. Knowledge and skill today are vital to your success. Knowledge and skill equals earning ability. Your knowledge and your ability to apply that knowledge to accomplish a result for which customers are willing to pay, it's critical. People who get laid off don't understand that they have not kept their knowledge and skill high enough to justify their earnings. They are becoming obsolete faster than ever before. See, that means that a job today can become obsolete within a week, a month, or a year. New technology can obsolete an entire industry in a couple of years. So, one of the questions you need to ask yourself all the time is this. What is your next career going to be? And here's the key question. What do you have to do now to bring your skills up to the point so that you can earn the kind of living and have the kind of lifestyle that you want in your next career? The key to your next career is personal excellence. It's to get to the top of the heap where you are now, get to the top of the field, and then to stay at the top of the field, to maintain and improve your lifestyle. What do you have to do? What do you have to be? Here's a good question. It's one of my favorite of all questions. Ask yourself, what one skill or set of skills could you develop that, if you became absolutely excellent at, would have the greatest positive impact on your future? What one skill or what one set of skills if you could develop them and become absolutely excellent at them, would have the greatest positive impact on your future? Your job is to define that. Ask your boss what it might be if necessary. Do everything possible to find out, and then develop those skills. Now, if you do not become a master of change, then you have no choice but to become a victim of change. If you do not become a master of circumstances, you become a creature of circumstances. You simply are buffeted about on the seas of life. Throughout everything that we've talked about with regard to earning ability, 
with regard to fast-tracking your career, with regard to fulfilling your potential and becoming everything you're capable of becoming, the critical point is continuous learning. I cannot tell you how important this is. I meet people all over the world who come to America and come here with nothing. And as a result of continuous learning, they're able to accomplish wonderful things and to make great lives for themselves. So, take charge of your life. See yourself as the president of your own company. See yourself as a leader. Set the standard in your world. Set the standard for your children. If you want your children to have a great life, you create a great life by dedicating yourself to continuous learning as well. See yourself as a role model, as all leaders do. Set high standards for yourself and work every single day to maintain and increase and improve your earning ability. So, there are 168 hours in a week. Every wonderful. Now, what we're saying is that if you want to go to the top of your field and be one of the highest paid and most successful people in life, take 10 of those hours and invest them in yourself. That's all. And this turned out to be the strategy practiced by all the top people I have worked with. The presidents of some of the biggest companies in the world, and they spend two to three hours each week reading and upgrading their skills. You know who the third richest man in the world is? It's a man named Warren Buffett. Last year, his total investments were worth $350 billion, third or fourth largest single company in the United States, one of the biggest companies in the world. Last year, his profits were $25 billion. By the way, $25 billion is good. That's a good amount for one person to grow a company that generates $25 billion in profits. And Warren Buffett has the same schedule almost every day. And what he does is he comes to work and he spends 80% of his time studying and reading in the subjects relative to his business. Only 20% is in meetings or phone calls or anything else. He spends 80% of his time learning new things so he can make better decisions and get better results. So, a question I sometimes ask adults is, how many hours a week do you spend studying new subjects to help increase your productivity and your value? So they found that these experts, these highly paid people, looked upon earning ability like a ladder. And a ladder has steps. And each step is a skill. And when you learn a new skill, you increase your earning ability. Also, you increase your ability to use your other skills. And each time you learn a new skill, your earning ability goes up. And when you learn a new skill, your earning ability goes up. And each new skill you learn causes you to become more and more valuable. And people will pay you more and more money for the results that you can get for them. Now, if at any given time you decide to stop climbing the ladder of success, you will level off like most people do. But then you will begin to decline because whatever skills you have are becoming obsolete at a rapid rate. And they're becoming obsolete faster today than ever before. So, if you are not constantly moving up the ladder, you're actually moving down the ladder. And people don't understand why their income is not going up. It's because they are not becoming more productive. They are not learning new skills. They're not working on themselves to become more successful. So, increasing your earning ability is the strategy used by the highest paid people in the world today. Every week they spend 10 hours or more studying new skills, the one skill that can help them the most. They keep climbing that ladder, and it just becomes a habit. A part of their life is learning, just like a part of your life may be watching television or playing sports or something else. A part of their life is learning all the time. It's your ability to focus single-mindedly on one thing at a time, and to work on that one task until it's complete and to discipline yourself not to do anything else, or to become distracted by emails and bells and bits and noises and things like that. It's just the ability to focus like a laser beam on a single task. Napoleon Hill did a subsequent book to his book Think and Grow Rich. It was called The Master Key to Riches, and after 260 pages, it gives you the answer, The Master Key to Riches. In the first paragraph, he explains, In this book, you will learn the master key to riches. So, it's a whole book on motivational ideas and principles, and the last line of the last chapter of the last page is, Now, you know the master key to riches is self-discipline. And what we have found is that the most successful people have come to that conclusion as well, is that self-discipline is the master key to success. A friend of mine wrote a best-selling book a couple of years ago, and basically what it said is, Whatever got you to where you are today is not enough to keep you there today. To go any further, you must develop new skills. And how long does this go on? All your life, for the rest of your life. When you're surrounded by rapid changes in information and technology and competition and government policies, as long as there is rapid change going on outside of you, there must be rapid change, and even faster change, 
going on inside of you if you want to be successful. So, the top people are the ones who keep learning new skills all the time. Seth Godin said, Everything is hard before it's easy, and everything at the beginning is difficult. But later, it becomes easy and automatic. You have to force yourself to discipline yourself in the beginning. But after that, it becomes easier and easier, and you actually feel happy. Now here's the most wonderful thing. When you discipline yourself to start and complete a task, or a part of a task, you feel like an athlete. So here's my question. If an athlete runs in a race and comes in first, what do they call this person? The winner. Exactly. I've studied this hundreds, thousands of hours. What it says is that when you win, when you come in as the winner, your body releases endorphins, which are called nature's happy drug. They make you happy. And dopamine, which is a form of energy that you get from a positive experience. So, when you complete the task, your body releases these drugs, and you feel happy. So they call it nature. The psychologists call it nature's happy drug. If you want to be happy, just start and complete a task, and you get a wow feel happy. In fact, in some of my seminars, I say, here's a question for you. What are you learning today? In other words, what is the subject that you are working on today? And what you should do, is you should ask people at the break, say, what is your subject today? What are you working on? What are you learning about today? And everybody should have an answer. Well, today I'm working on strategy. Today I'm working on sales. Today I'm working on presentations. Today I'm working on team building. Everybody should be working on developing a new skill. Well, this brings us to what I call the basics. And you know, we cannot change the world, but we can constantly go back to our touchstones where we can hold on and grab on. And I think there are three basics. I call them the basics. And I take it from the old story about Vince Lombardi when he took over the Green Bay Packers. He was asked, are you going to change the running plays, blocking plays? You could bring in a new game book and so on. And he said, no, we're not going to do anything different. We're going to become the best running, blocking, passing, kicking team in football. We're going to become brilliant on the basics. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege to stand before you today to discuss a topic that is very close to my heart and vital for anyone looking to lead a life of success and fulfillment. We're going to dive into a subject that affects us all one way or another, breaking the shackles of negative thinking. Now, why is this important? Well, let me tell you, your mind is a powerful tool. It can be your greatest ally or your most formidable foe. The thoughts that percolate in your mind can either lift you to the heights of success or drag you into the depths of despair. Negative thinking, my friends, is a barrier to all we wish to achieve. It's like driving through life with a handbrake on. It slows you down, makes the journey more difficult, and ultimately, it can stop you from reaching your destination. But what exactly is negative thinking? It's more than just a fleeting feeling of disappointment or a momentary doubt. It's a persistent pattern of pessimism, a habit of expecting the worst, and a tendency to focus on problems rather than solutions. It's looking at the world through a lens that dims the brightness of opportunities and magnifies the shadows of obstacles. The impact of indulging in such thinking patterns is profound. It affects how we feel, the decisions we make, and the actions we take. It influences our relationships, our work, and ultimately, our happiness. But here's the good news. Just as we've learned to think negatively, we can also learn to think positively. The power to change our thought patterns lies within us, and today, we're going to explore how to unleash that power. Not just to identify and understand the roots of negative thinking, but to learn practical, actionable strategies to break free from it. My goal is for you to walk away not just inspired, but equipped with the tools you need to transform your thinking, and by extension, transform your life. As we've just begun to scratch the surface of understanding the profound impact our thoughts have on our lives, it's crucial to dive deeper into the realm of negative thinking, its genesis, its pervasive influence, and most importantly, how it shapes our personal and professional existence. Take a moment to reflect on this. Have you ever found yourself caught in the grip of pessimism, where every possibility seems to be cloaked in doom, every opportunity riddled with obstacles? This, my friends, is the essence of negative thinking, a labyrinth of dark alleys that lead nowhere but down. Negative thinking isn't just an occasional visitor in the quiet moments of doubt. It's an unwelcome tenant in the mind, casting long shadows over our brightest aspirations. It manifests in various guises, fear of failure, the specter of rejection, the dread of uncertainty. 
These are not mere transient thoughts. They are deeply ingrained patterns that skew our perception, convincing us that the worst will happen even when evidence points to the contrary. You might wonder, how does one fall into this trap of negative thinking? It often begins innocuously, a small seed of doubt planted by a passing comment, a minor setback, or perhaps an ingrained belief from our formative years. These seeds, if watered by continuous worry, sprout into formidable trees of negativity, their roots entwined around our self-esteem, their branches casting shadows over our potential. Common triggers are everywhere. Past failures, societal pressures, even the daily newsfeed, all fertilizing these seeds of doubt. The impact of harboring such thoughts is profound and far-reaching in our personal lives. Negative thinking strains relationships, erects barriers to happiness, and erodes our self-worth. It's like walking through life with a filter that dims the vibrancy of joy and amplifies the darkness of every challenge. Professionally, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of failure. Opportunities are bypassed, or fear of failure stifles innovation. The potential for growth and success is shackled by chains of pessimism. But here's the turning point, the beacon in the fog, the realization that while negative thinking is a formidable foe, it is not invincible. The first step to breaking free from the cycle is awareness, recognizing these patterns for what they are, distortions of reality, not predictors of our fate. This awareness is the dawn of change, the moment we decide not to be passive spectators in our minds, but active participants, choosing which thoughts to nurture and which to challenge. As we stand on the threshold of transformation, let's remind ourselves that the journey from negative to positive thinking isn't a leap across a chasm, but a step onto a bridge. A bridge built on self-awareness, resilience, and the unwavering belief in our capacity to change. The path may be steeped in challenge, but it is also ripe with possibility. Remember, it's not just about reaching the destination, it's about shedding the weight of negativity that we've carried for far too long, freeing ourselves to embrace the vast expanse of our potential. So, as we navigate the complexities of our thoughts, forge ahead with a clear vision and a steadfast heart, knowing that each step forward is a step away from the shadows of negative thinking and into the light of positive possibilities. The journey begins with a single step, a step of courage, a step of faith, a step towards a life not defined by the fears of yesterday, but illuminated by the hopes of tomorrow. As we transition from the shadowy realm of negative thinking into the luminous world of positive thought, it becomes imperative to understand the stark contrast between the two and the transformative power that positive thinking holds. Imagine standing at a crossroads. One path shrouded in fog where every step is heavy with doubt and fear. The other bathed in sunlight where each step is light and filled with hope. This imagery encapsulates the essence of moving from negative to positive thinking. Positive thinking isn't merely a switch to flick, but a perspective to cultivate. A lens through which the world becomes a realm of possibilities, rather than a minefield of obstacles. Where negative thinking narrows our vision, positive thinking expands it allowing us to see beyond current challenges to the opportunities that lie ahead. It's about acknowledging the presence of obstacles, but recognizing them as stepping stones rather than stumbling blocks. The stories of individuals who have harnessed the power of positive thinking to transform their lives are both inspiring and instructive. Take the case of a young entrepreneur whose startup faced near collapse, where negative thinking might have led him to give up, Positive thinking propelled him to view the crisis as a learning opportunity. He reevaluated his business model, made the necessary adjustments, and in doing so not only saved his business, but also paved the way for its future success. This shift in mindset from seeing failure as a terminal verdict to viewing it as a pivot point is at the heart of positive thinking. Another compelling example is that of a woman diagnosed with a chronic illness. Instead of succumbing to despair, she chose to focus on wellness, channeling her energies into activities that enriched her spirit and strengthened her body. Her journey was not without its trials, but her positive outlook became a beacon of hope not just for herself, but for others facing similar challenges. These stories underscore a fundamental truth. The quality of our lives is shaped not by our circumstances, but by our responses to them. The benefits of positive thinking are not just anecdotal. They are supported by a growing body of scientific evidence. Research has shown that a positive mindset can enhance our health, increase our longevity, and improve our overall well-being.
Studies indicate that individuals with a positive outlook tend to have lower levels of stress, better immune function, and a reduced risk of heart disease. Furthermore, positive thinking has been linked to better decision-making, higher creativity, and increased problem-solving capabilities. It's as if positive thinking unlocks parts of our brain that remain dormant under the cloud of negativity. The contrast between negative and positive thinking can be likened to the difference between a garden overrun by weeds and one where flowers bloom in abundance. Negative thinking chokes our potential, whereas positive thinking nurtures and allows it to flourish. The transformation from a weed-filled garden to a flourishing one requires effort, tension, and persistence. Similarly, cultivating a positive mindset requires us to weed out negative thoughts and plant seeds of optimism, gratitude, and resilience in their place. As we stand at this juncture, poised to embrace the power of positive thinking, remember that the journey ahead is one of gradual change and steady progress. It's about making a conscious choice day after day to focus on the positive, to seek out the silver lining, and to believe in the possibility of a brighter tomorrow. This choice is the key that unlocks the door to a life where challenges are met with courage, where setbacks are seen as opportunities for growth, and where every moment is infused with the potential for joy and fulfillment. The lessons from those who have walked this path before us draw strength from their stories and inspiration from their successes. Armed with the knowledge that while the road may be long, each step taken in positivity brings us closer to our goals, closer to realizing our full potential, and closer to the life we aspire to lead, the luminous path of positive thinking. It is crucial to understand that the foundation of lasting change lies in our ability to recognize challenges and transform our negative thought patterns. This transformation is not merely an act of willpower. It is a strategic endeavor that begins with a deep dive into self-awareness. Imagine for a moment that your mind is a garden. Just as a gardener must identify the weeds choking the life out of their flowers, you too must identify the negative thoughts that cloud your mind. These are not just any thoughts. They are the persistent whispers of doubt, fear, and self-criticism that have perhaps taken root over years. Recognizing these patterns is the first step toward reclaiming the terrain of your mind. Once identified, the real work begins, challenging and reframing these negative thoughts. It's akin to standing in front of a mirror and daring to see beyond the flaws to the strength and beauty within. When a thought arises suggesting, I can't do this, pause and ask yourself, is this really true? More often than not, you'll find that these negative beliefs are not facts but rather distorted reflections of past experiences and fears. This process of questioning lays the groundwork for one of the most powerful strategies in our arsenal, the replacement of negative thoughts with positive affirmations. Imagine for a moment that each positive statement you make about yourself is a seed being planted in the fertile ground of your mind. With repetition, these seeds grow slowly but surely, transforming the landscape of your thoughts from one dominated by doubt to one flourishing with self-belief and potential. Yet the transformation doesn't end there. The role of goal setting in this journey cannot be overstated. By focusing on solutions rather than problems, we shift our perspective from what is holding us back to what will propel us forward. Setting clear achievable goals acts as a beacon guiding us through the fog of negativity toward a future we not only aspire to, but are actively working towards. In the grand scheme of things, these strategies are more than just tools to combat negative thinking. They are the building blocks of a mindset that seeks out light even in the darkest of times. They remind us that while we may not have control over every circumstance we face, we have the power to choose how we respond to them. Our standing, breaking free from negative thinking, is not a destination, but a journey. It is a path that requires patience, persistence, and most importantly, a belief in our own capacity to change. Armed with self-awareness, a willingness to challenge our deepest doubts, and a commitment to focusing on the positive, we step into a world of endless possibilities. Proceed then, not as prisoners of our past thoughts, but as architects of our future, building one positive thought at a time, a life that reflects our highest aspirations, fostering a mindset brimming with positivity. Turn our attention to the soil in which this mindset is nurtured, our environment, the spaces we inhabit, the air we breathe, and, most importantly, the company we keep. Collectively, they shape the garden of our mind. Imagine for a moment you're a plant. Would you thrive better in a parched desert or a flourishing greenhouse? The answer seems obvious, doesn't it? 
This analogy paints a vivid picture of the critical importance of surrounding ourselves with positive influences. Consider the people in your life as the water and sunlight to your growth. Just as a plant leans towards the light, we too must lean towards those who bring light into our life. These are the individuals who uplift us, who see the potential within us that we might not yet see in ourselves, and who encourage us to stretch towards our highest selves. But how do we cultivate such a supportive social circle? It begins with intentionality. Like attracts like, as they say. To attract positivity, we must first embody it. Engage in activities that elevate your spirit, and seek out communities where such positivity flourishes. It may be a book club, a fitness group, or a volunteer organization. Bases where positive energy is the common language spoken. Now consider the profound impact of positive affirmations and visualizations. These are not mere words or daydreams, but powerful tools in shaping our reality. Affirmations are the nutrients we feed our minds, essential in fortifying our belief in our capabilities and worth. Then, each day, by affirming your value, your strength, and your potential, let these affirmations be your first thoughts in the morning and your last at night. They are the protective shield against the arrows of doubt and negativity. Visualizations, on the other hand, are the blueprints of the life we aspire to build. They are the practice of seeing, not just with our eyes but with our hearts and mind. By visualizing our goals as already achieved, we not only fuel our motivation but also activate our creative subconscious to generate ideas and opportunities to make these visions a reality. It's as if by visualizing, we pull the future into the present, making it tangible and achievable. Yet building this positive environment is not a solitary endeavor. It requires the collective effort of our community. Just as we seek out positive influences, we must also strive to be that positive influence in the lives of others. Share your affirmations, vocalize your belief in the potential of those around you, and celebrate their successes as if they were your own. In doing so, we create a ripple effect, a wave of positivity that can uplift an entire community. As we venture forth, let us be mindful architects of our environments, curating spaces both physical and emotional that nourish our souls, foster growth, and illuminate our path. This be a collaborative journey, one where we lift each other towards our collective potential, creating a symphony of positivity that resonates far beyond the confines of our immediate surroundings. Adopting a growth mindset not only complements but magnifies the effects of a positive environment, setting the stage for a life of continual growth and boundless possibilities. Emboldened by the knowledge that in the garden of life, we are both the gardeners and the blossoms, with the power to cultivate an existence marked by positivity, resilience, and unyielding growth. Another transformative concept that further propels us on our journey towards excellence, adopting a growth mindset. This concept is not just another buzzword in the lexicon of personal development. It is a pivotal shift in perspective that has the power to reshape our lives from the ground up. A growth mindset in its essence is the belief that our abilities and intelligence can be developed through dedication, hard work, and persistence. It stands in stark contrast to a fixed mindset, which holds the belief that our talents and capabilities are static and unchangeable traits we're born with. Imagine for a moment two artists. One believes their skill is innate and finite, while the other sees it as something that can be honed and expanded. The latter is likely to embrace challenges, persist in the face of setbacks, and see effort as a pathway to mastery. This is the crux of a growth mindset. But why is this shift in perspective so critical? It fundamentally changes how we view challenges and obstacles. Instead of seeing them as insurmountable barriers, we view them as opportunities to learn and grow. A growth mindset liberates us from the fear of failure, allowing us to approach our goals with a sense of curiosity and resilience. The difference between a fixed and a growth mindset is not just academic. It has real tangible impacts on our behavior, our relationship with success and failure, and ultimately on the trajectory of our lives. So how do we cultivate this powerful mindset? It begins with recognizing that our brains are incredibly malleable. Neuroscience has shown us that the brain is capable of forming new connections and adapting throughout our lives, a process known as neuroplasticity. This scientific evidence underpins the growth mindset, offering a beacon of hope to anyone who has ever doubted their potential. The journey towards embracing a growth mindset is paved with practical steps. First and foremost, it requires us to be mindful of our language and self-talk. 
The way we talk to ourselves can either fortify a fixed mindset or nurture a growth one. When faced with a setback, instead of saying, I can't do this, we can ask, what can I learn from this? This subtle shift in language reflects a profound change in how we perceive our abilities. Moreover, setting incremental goals that focus on the process rather than the outcome is another crucial step. Celebrating small victories and learning from failures along the way reinforces the belief that growth and improvement are always within our reach. It's about embracing the journey with all its ups and downs as an opportunity for continuous learning and development. In essence, adopting a growth mindset is not merely about achieving success in the traditional sense. It's about redefining what success means to us personally. It's about seeing ourselves not as finished products, but as works in progress, constantly evolving and expanding our horizons as we continue to push the boundaries of our capabilities. Let us do so with the understanding that our potential is not predetermined, but something we actively shape with every decision we make, every challenge we embrace, and every setback we overcome. This mindset is the compass that guides us, reminding us that in the vast ocean of potential that lies within us, the winds of perseverance, curiosity, and resilience are what sail us to the shores of our most aspirational selves. Step into this journey with open hearts and minds, ready to embrace the endless possibilities that come with believing in our ability to grow beyond our current confines. As we bask in the realization that adopting a growth mindset can significantly transform our lives, let's shift our focus to maintaining momentum. This is about nurturing daily practices that ensure our newfound positivity doesn't just peak, but continues to grow, strengthening our mental and emotional resilience. Imagine this as cultivating a garden of positivity where each day we tend to our thoughts and actions, ensuring they align with our aspirations and goals. At the heart of sustaining this momentum is the practice of gratitude and mindfulness. Consider gratitude not just as an act, but as a state of being, where every morning we count our blessings, acknowledging the good in our lives. This act alone can pivot our perspective from what we lack to what we possess, fueling a sense of contentment and positivity. Mindfulness, on the other hand, invites us to live in the present, fully experiencing the moment without judgment. It's about observing our thoughts and emotions without getting entangled in them. Incorporating mindfulness into our daily routine through meditation or simply practicing awareness can significantly reduce stress and anxiety, fostering a state of inner peace and positivity. Let's not overlook the power of continuous learning and personal development. This is the fuel that keeps the fire of positivity burning. By dedicating ourselves to lifelong learning, we constantly challenge our minds, introduce new perspectives, and break the monotony that often leads to negativity. But how do we integrate these practices into our daily lives to ensure sustained positivity? It begins with making small incremental changes. Start your day with a gratitude journal, spend a few minutes in meditation or mindfulness practice, set aside time each week for learning something new. These actions, though seemingly small, create ripples that can transform the very fabric of our lives. As we stand on the precipice of a new dawn in our journey, let us reflect on the path we've traversed together. We've embarked on a transformative voyage from understanding the quagmire of negative thinking to embracing the radiant power of positivity. Remember, the essence of our journey lies not just in understanding these strategies, but in embodying them. The power of positive thinking is not merely a concept to be admired from afar, but a beacon to guide our every step. It is a testament to the indomitable human spirit that thrives on hope, resilience, and the relentless pursuit of growth. Now, as we gaze into the horizon, let us do so with the conviction that the future is ours to shape. Let this moment be a clarion call to action, to embrace change with open arms, to commit to nurturing our minds with thoughts that uplift and empower, to cultivate environments that foster positivity, to surround ourselves with those who champion our highest selves, and to embark on a ceaseless journey of learning and personal development. The path forward is luminous with the promise of what we can become. It beckons us to step into our power, to cast aside the shadows of doubt, and to stride forth with confidence into a future of our own making. Remember, in the garden of life, we are both the gardeners and the blossoms. Let us tend to our garden with love, patience, and the unwavering belief in our potential to flourish. So, let this not be an ending, but a beginning. The dawn of a new chapter in your life marked by positivity, growth, and boundless possibilities. The journey ahead is yours to chart. A testament to the transformative power of positive thinking, 
and the enduring strength of the human spirit. Step forward with courage, for the best is yet to come.